Now, many of you who have come into the church were handed a form, and if you don't have one, the ushers will give it to you, but you were handed a form with respect to what's called Project or Plan 100. Reverend Morton spoke about our goal to reach 100 families, 100 households. There's some over here, Sister. 100 households. For Jesus Christ. And the reason that we have done this is to impact this world for the kingdom of God. There is no greater way to shape society than to shape families. And we need to be the place where families can come to know what a marriage should be like, where people can learn how to be good parents, where children can learn the blessing of being obedient to parents, and where the framework for which our moral behavior is shaped. <coughs> this world's ways, the culture around us, are increasingly becoming anti God. The programs that the government is offering are increasingly becoming ineffective in addressing the ills of this world. And so the gospel is the answer. And we need to get families. Just like I talked about earlier, it was within the context of a family. It wasn't just church. It was around the altar at home. It was around devotions at home. It was around lessons at home. It was around a demonstration of parents who lived out their faith at home that had its greatest impact on my life. And I believe it is the way in which God intended for us to save the world. The great desire of God is that all would be saved. <coughs> Did you hear that? It is God's desire to have a personal relationship with each one of us. God wants us to experience him, to experience his love, to enjoy his blessing. My Bible says in John 3.16 that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life. The Bible says God sent his son into the world not to condemn the world but that the world through him might be saved. Luke 19 and 10 tells us emphatically that the Son of Man came to seek and save those who are lost. That's why Jesus came. He came, as John the Baptist said, when he saw Jesus walking, uh, he said, Behold the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. And so, uh, God wants this relationship. Jesus came and died that we might have this relationship. And the great work of the church is to be witnesses of him, to evangelize, to tell the story about Jesus Christ. Our chief concern in the church should not be the color of robes or the calendar of ministry. It ought to be about soul. Our preoccupation ought to be how are people's souls faring. Programs are okay and, and picnics are okay and activities are okay. But 
the main goal is not concerts and get-togethers, but soul winning. That's the priority. There is no greater work. There is no higher calling for us greater by the way as a church for you and I as individuals than sharing the good news that Jesus Christ died for sin and that salvation is available to all who call on his name. That's what ministry should be about. The business of saving or souls or at least sharing the word God does the saving and making disciples winning folks for the Lord and teaching them that there is a better way of life I don't know about you but it's my observation that folks are messed up in their thinking folks are living life without a clue they don't know how to have good marriages. They don't know how to raise children uh, yeah. Yeah. often. And I'm not, I'm making blanket general statements, but even when we think we know, the results say that we're not doing a very good job. Yeah. And I'm not only talking about those who are outside of the walls, I'm even talking about those of us who are inside yes. the walls. Yes. If the divorce rate between those who profess Christianity and those in the world is essentially the same, something is wrong. Yes, sir. If, if our children in the church are still getting engaged in drugs and engaged in the legal system and engaged in uh, sexual activity before marriage at the same rate as others, something is wrong. Folk need Jesus. Folks are making poor decisions and exhibiting bad behavior and engaging in harmful habits. Jesus Christ is the answer. And you and I have this great opportunity, let alone the charge and command, to go and share the gospel story. Right. We need to tell folk that, look, Jesus Christ one day picked me up. Turn me around, place my feet on solid ground, establish my going and put a new song in my mouth. We need to share that story. Like I said before, everybody here went to far country. Everybody here was once a sinner. Everybody here needed to surrender to Jesus Christ. And if you've experienced the love of Christ, you have a story to share. We need to become fishers of men. God inspired me to have this church to engage in what I call uh, uh, Plan 100. And, and, and understand this. Let me make this clear. There is never a need to have a special program or some uh, 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 activity that's specially designed to do the work that we already should be doing each and every day. All it really is is a way to organize it and to put extra activity into it so that we can yield greater results. But after Project 100, the work continues. And so over the next hundred days, I'm going to be asking each of you to engage in special activities and actions that will hopefully yield to us a great text for the kingdom. What better way to acknowledge and observe our church's 60th anniversary than to exalt the king and expand the kingdom? I'm reminded, and I'm really going to sort of preach, but kind of walk you through that form a bit too. Uh, in Scripture, in the Gospel of Jesus Christ, as recorded by Luke, I'm sorry, Matthew, excuse me, the fourth chapter. Beginning at verse number 17, 
It is there that you will find these words. From that time, Jesus began to preach and to say, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. And Jesus, walking by the Sea of Galilee, saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. Then he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. They immediately left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets. He called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. Amen. In looking at this text, we see Jesus, it said, after having been baptized by his cousin John in the Jordan River and having been endowed by the Holy Spirit, filled and, and, and led by the Spirit of God, he engaged in work of ministry. And I want you to know that you can't be an effective minister for God without the leading of the Holy Spirit. You can't engage in effective ministry for God without the power of the Holy Spirit. Your human reasoning, your intellectual prowess, your uh, 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 gifts and talents in the flesh cannot do the work of the Lord. You need the Holy Ghost. And here is Jesus Christ Having been filled with the Spirit, now it says he began to preach and say, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. The main vehicle by which God uses to get folk to come to Christ is the preaching of the word of God and the personal witness of his saints. Did you hear me? The main way that God gets folks saved is through the word and through the witness of his saints. There is no other agency that is commissioned to carry out the work of evangelism. The president will not make a committee. The governor will not establish a commission. The community-based organizations, even faith-based, are prohibited by law from proselytizing for the kingdom. But the church, our great commission is to be the mouthpieces of God and through the preaching and teaching of the gospel and the witness of the saints, we are to save folks or to witness to them so that God can save them. Romans 10, 17 says, so faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Paul said in Romans the first chapter 16th verse I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ because the gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes. The gospel, the word of God, is the power of salvation to everyone who believes. Listen, Jesus did not use gimmicks. He did not use giveaways. He didn't have special promotions. He didn't use sophisticated marketing techniques to draw folks to himself. He simply preached. And notice that Jesus' preaching didn't focus on political things. He didn't 
proclaim his personal preferences. He didn't simply talk about current events. His sermons weren't designed to entertain the listeners. He didn't tell engaging stories simply to make folk feel good. He preached the word of God. He offered them the kingdom of God. And notice what it said. The main subject of his message was repent. Turn from sin and turn to God. I know we got a problem preaching about sin. I know we got a problem confronting folk with the truth. But my Bible said Jesus said repent. We've got to never leave the message of repentance out of the gospel that we preach. There are pulpits occupied all across this country preaching and teaching anything and everything else but repent. They are preaching health, wealth, and prosperity. There are churches that you can go into and they'll preach a number that you can play. There are those who are spewing out pseudo cycle a uh, babble across the pulpit, the, you know, the power of positive thinking, and, and there are those who preach denominationalism and spiritual supremacy as if they got a lock on the Holy Spirit because of their denomination. There are those who simply preach fire and brimstone and forget to say that he died, that you might live, and that if you do repent, you your soul can be saved. There are those who preach from what we call a postmodernistic point of view. There is no right or wrong. There is no good or bad. There is no heaven or hell. There just is, and whatever you believe, it's all right. Listen, the gospel is the vehicle that we must learn to share. It is the word of God that saves folk. You know, I was I don't know how many of you have been keeping up with this uh, legislative referendum that was vetoed by the governor in the state of Arizona, but what it was was a referendum that allowed people to deny serving others based on religious beliefs. So if I was a waiter in a restaurant and I did not want to serve you because you were homosexual, I could refuse to serve based on my religious belief. But what amazes me is that these self-righteous, hypocritical folk who are trying to legislate somebody's behavior, really it was a failed attempt to legislate discrimination. They don't know the God that I know. Jesus would never legislate not serving or interacting with the sinner. In fact, my Bible says I found Jesus in the midst of having dinner with the sinner. And I'm assuming that Jesus was passing the peas and, and the gravy and, and, and serving like he did his disciples because Jesus said, I didn't come to seek the save. I came to seek the lost. And how dare we try to legislate that we aren't to serve somebody based on our religious belief. I don't want to be a part of religion that doesn't reach out to the one that's lost. Now, there are some nuances there that say, well, you know, should churches have to hire certain people based on that? I think that there are some shades of nuances that we have to be careful of. But to the idea that I can refuse somebody who really, again, was a veiled attempt at discriminating against homosexuals. And there were a whole lot of folks who signed on to it until the political backlash. And not out of a change of heart or some prayerful thinking, but because of political repercussions, they vetoed the bill. But there are folk who in their heart are still trying to have this moral superiority, this self-righteousness. I don't want us to be a part of that crowd. And by the way, you can never, listen, you can't put enough rules and regulations to get folk right. Didn't Jesus try to tell us that all of the law wasn't designed to get you to act right? The law was designed to show you how wrong you are. It was designed to show you, you can't keep it. And what he's trying to do is to get us to commit to him, to rely on him, to seek him in order that we might be saved. There are no other ways 
except the gospel of Jesus Christ to get folks saved. Listen, there are, I believe, 17 movies. They say 17 Bible-based or gospel-themed movies coming out this year. The Son of God hit the theaters Friday. Noah's coming. Um, Exodus is coming. There are, I think it was either 14 or 17 this year that will be released. And listen, I'm not telling you not to go to the movies. These might be some pretty good movies. But don't think for a moment that movies will replace the gospel message. Uh, you can take your friend to the movies, but after the movies, if your friend don't know Jesus, you ought to invite them to the Savior and point them to the Scripture. Because it is through the preaching and teaching of the gospel. So after verse 17, it said Jesus, he went preaching, uh, repent the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. The king is here. That's, what's, what's that uh, documentary uh, about Ali when it said the king is here? The king is here. <laughs> well, yeah. well, you got to be a sports fan to keep up with that one. So we're going to leave that one for the men's group. It says in verse 18, Jesus walking by the Sea of Galilee saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. And they had left their nets immediately and followed him. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James the son of Zebedee and John, his brother, in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. And immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. If Jesus chose to, he could have done all the preaching and all the teaching and all the ministry himself. If he chose to, he could have done it all himself, but the plan of God is that there is what we call the body of Christ. Now, it's interesting that we've called the body of Christ. He's the head, and we're the body. Now, my head does a whole lot of thinking, a whole lot of directing, but it's my body that does all the execution. Yesterday, my wife told me that I should go out and try to chip up some of that ice that had accumulated on the driveway that thick because when sister girlfriend is walking in and out of the house, she's basically ice skating versus walking. And at first I'm like, well, it's cold outside. Brother's tired having hang out with Tony all afternoon. And, and our brother want to go and watch some basketball and chill out. However, my head started doing some thinking. That sister girl said she's doing ice skate, and if girlfriend slipped, brother gonna be in trouble. So I went to the garage and got out the, the spade and began to chip away at the ice. And I was working and chipping away. It took me almost a half hour, 45 minutes just to make a path. I couldn't get it all, but I made a path, brother Tim, a pathway so now sister Lindsay can walk on dry ground. Now my whole point is that my head made a decision, but it was my body that was doing the work. My legs and my arms and when I came in and finally laid down to watch Michigan lay one on Michigan State, uh, uh, my body was aching, but my head was alright. The body of Christ does the work. We have been commissioned to go do the work. And so, here we find him calling believers to be engaged in this work of ministry. And the believers in this text are two sets of brothers, Peter and Andrew and James and John. And Jesus, I want you to know, he didn't just call you to be saved. He didn't just call you, Brother Curtis, to sit up and look real cool in the pulpit. He didn't call you to simply sit in the pew and, 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 and feast on the songs and pray. He wants us to be engaged in the great work of ministry. There should be no member who is not active in some ministry. Notice that when Jesus called folk 
in the ministry by the way he called some folk who are already busy. That's just a sad note. And notice that he also called ordinary people. Jesus did not go downtown to the A-list crowd. He did not go to the high and mighty, the, the folks who uh, were, were on the upper echelons. He, he, he went and found some everyday folk. He, he found some what I would call some average Joe. And he asked if they would come work in ministry. And I want you to know what I love about it is he took some everyday, ordinary men to do some extraordinary things. For my Bible said that these ordinary men almost turned the world upside down for Jesus. I, I, I was told that these ordinary men who were deemed as ignorant by Gamaliel in the council, uh, they took note though that these men had been with Jesus. And Gamaliel said, well, we better stop this because if this thing is of God, we can't touch it. Jesus found these ordinary men, commissioned them to do extraordinary things, and that's what he did when he called me. I sit here sometime in full amazement as I'm praising God and saying, my God, you took me from there. You took me from my darkest days. You took me from the bottom of the barrel. You took me from the scrap heap of sin and you changed my life and got the nerve to bless me and to give me a, a solid ground and a, a, a wonderful family and stability and bless me with all that I need for righteousness and, and for provisions for this life and then got the nerve on top of that to allow me to be used as a vessel and instrument of you to carry this wonderful treasure of heavenly truth in this body of earth and vessel. What kind of God is this? He takes ordinary folk to do extraordinary things. And notice what Jesus did. Jesus didn't, like I said, he didn't use gimmicks in it. He, he, he saw those fellas on the boat. And I know they had heard Jesus preaching and teaching. I know they had heard him break the word down. And when he saw them, he said, follow me. Sometimes we try to make this call to discipleship, complicated. We want to take them through the 18 steps and the 14 ways. And, the, you know, we want to give, listen, sometimes we ought to just need to give your life to the Lord. Amen. Jesus said, follow me. Now, notice another thing. He did not say, follow me and I'll make you rich. Follow me and I'm going to bless you. Follow me and the way is going to be straight. He didn't offer help, wealth, and prosperity. He didn't offer to make them famous. But he did make them a promise. He said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Listen, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. They were already fishers of fish. They understood the concept of fishing, but they didn't have a clue about fishing for men. And a lot of us think that we know how to get folk to come. We got clever ideas on how to get folk, but all I want you to do is follow Jesus. And Jesus will make you a fisher of men. Too many of us say that we're uncomfortable with evangelism. We, we, we say I'm, I'm scared or uh, it's, not, it's just not me. Uh, 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 I, I don't know how to witness. But that's just the work of the enemy. Trying to negate the gospel going out. That's just Satan trying to hinder the word of God going first. What is there to be afraid of to offer somebody eternal life? Imagine driving down the street, and I'm driving by my friend's house, and I notice that my friend's house is on fire. And I look at my friend's house.
house on fire and realize that my friend might be inside. Don't you think I love my friend enough to go and yeah, hey man, your house is on fire. And don't you think I know enough to try and save my friend because if he stays in the house and is on fire, he's going to die. <laughs> Yet we're afraid to evangelize. Huh? We're scared to tell people that if you don't accept Jesus Christ, as your savior, that you will die. And in hell, you'll lift up your eyes. I'd rather my friend get saved and die in a house fire than to save him from a house fire but never tell him about Jesus. We cannot be afraid. Notice that Jesus said, I will make you Fishers of men. We need to understand it's God who empowers us and enables us and teaches us to do this great work of evangelism. And notice it said that they left their occupation as fishers of fish to become fishers of men. And in following Jesus and making a commitment to him, they made a huge sacrifice. They left their nets. They left their livelihood. They left their boats and chose a new profession of fishing for men. The scripture didn't tell you and me to leave our livelihood. It simply told us to be witnesses of him, to let our light shine. You can keep your job and let your light shine. These guys were so committed, they left all immediately to follow Jesus and Jesus took them away from their jobs which supported their families which fed them and clothed them now imagine the sacrifice they made it didn't tell us how they supported themselves or their households once they left fishing but you can rest assured when you follow Jesus my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches in glory. None of these men went without. None of their families were hurting for anything that they needed. And I'm here to let you know that we too ought to be willing to make a sacrifice for the Lord to become fishers of men. He didn't call us perhaps to leave our jobs or our livelihoods, but the work of ministry requires sacrifice. It requires Self-denial. They left their nets immediately. They were willing and eager to follow Jesus. They didn't hem and they didn't haunt. They didn't mull it over in their heads or think about it for a while, take two weeks to think it through. They immediately left their nets and followed him. And notice that the text points out that James and John left their boats and their father to follow Jesus. Now, you got to understand what he's saying here. It's just like when the Bible says a man ought to leave his father and mother and cleave to a wife. It's not saying that they never had anything else to do with daddy, but daddy no longer is the focal point. In their culture, daddy was the patriarch, and he was the focal point of the family. Jesus said, no longer your earthly father, but now your heavenly father is your focal point. They left daddy's house to go work for the daddy's house. I know you got that. God is to become a priority in our lives. Everything else is secondary. Your job, your career, your profession, and your relationship with everybody else. In order to stimulate our efforts to make progress toward our goal of having 100 families active in ministry and membership, at Greater Bible Way, we talked about Project 100. And simply, brothers and sisters, I'm asking you through Project 100 to follow me as I follow Christ. Jesus is calling for us to become fishers of men and fishers of women and fishers of young people. You see outlined on your plan that this is 100 days. 40 days of fasting and prayer and 60 days of action. It tells 
tells you that you got to make a sacrifice. you got to deny yourself. So we for Lent, which starts Wednesday, you need to, on that sheet, it has a, a commitment form. You need to identify what am I willing to give up for those 40 days. And some of us need to put some stuff down in there. We're going to give up for good. Amen? It's a good time to get rid of some bad habits. If you smoke, it's, it's time to say, I'm going to give those up, but scratch out the 40 days. Amen? Amen. Because there are some things that you don't need to pick back up again. But there might be some other things that you'll give up for the 40 and they're all right to pick back up. I'm simply saying you determine. And listen, it could be one, two, three. But I want you to be serious about your commitment. Don't commit to what you're not willing to do. But don't do what doesn't take a sacrifice to do. You might say it's too hard. Well, that's you in the right direction now. You might say, that's too costly. Yeah, well, you're in the right area now. Yeah, yeah. If you say, oh, I can do this, then maybe you need to think about it some more. You need to deny yourself. It could be food, a hobby, a pastime, something that you hold in high esteem. Notice it said, uh, follow me, I'll make you fishers of men. We need to seek the salvation of our kindred and acquaintance. I want you to put six fish. Six people don't. Don't call them fish, but that's just the term I use. Put six people, and I only say six because we're using the theme of six and sixty, but you can use the back of your page. You can list sixty people that you will commit to pray for their salvation, that you will lift up in prayer every day and at least for six minutes a day. Now, somebody said, now, wait a minute, six minutes a day. Now, I'm not telling you to limit your prayers to six minutes, but I'm saying at least six minutes. And by the way, I want to, I dare you, I dare, some of us don't pray six minutes a week. I'm going to let you think about that for a while. To pray six minutes a day, some of us don't recognize that by the time we get on our knees and get back up, you still got three or four minutes left of the six. We need to be serious about the idea of prayer. And so I'm going to think about six minutes is all I ask. Now, pray for 60, but give six toward the salvation of your kindred and acquaintances. But I put down there, pray without ceasing. So six additional minutes to pray for the ministry, pray for your pastor, pray for our efforts, pray for this anniversary celebration, pray for your brothers and sisters in Christ. And then the 60 days of action, as we ask God to help us become fishers of men, then we're going to go out and do some fishing. We can talk about fishing. We can show pictures of fishing. We can uh, show film clips of fishing. But at a certain point, we got to go fish. We're going to go fishing. And I already have another form where you can track your activity. I don't want us just to say we fishing. I wanted you to see whether you're fishing or not. And so you'll write down your six prospects, and every week you can mark whether you called them or visited or prayed or handed them a track, invited them to church, invited them to Christ, and we're going to see just how many seeds we're sowing. My brothers and sisters, this isn't simply a gimmick. This isn't simply an exercise designed to make us feel like we're doing something special. This is just us doing what we ought to be doing. It's me encouraging us to say, we will, oh God, be obedient to you. We will, oh God, be used by you. We will, oh God, be fishers of men. Listen, there are a whole lot of fish out there that need to be caught. Some alcoholic fish. Some drug addicted fish. Some sexually promiscuous fish, some immoral, sexually immoral fish, some some crooked businessmen fish, some some lying and cheating and dishonest fish. There are some fish who don't understand what God designed for marriage is. There are some backbiting and some gossiping fish. There are some uncaring and hateful and vengeful fish who are looking to be caught. There are some envious fish, some proud fish, some angry fish, some confused fish. There are some self-righteous fish that are looking to be caught. There are some fish that are trapped in the underclass and mired down 
in poverty and don't know a way out. There are some hopeless fish, some helpless fish, some powerless fish, some needy fish, some unholy fish, some conceited fish, some perverted fish. There are fish that are shacked up and knocked up and caught up and messed up and tore up from the floor. But God gave you and I the commission to go out and to become fishers of those who are lost, fishers of those who are blind, fishers of those who need salvation. Listen, I was once a sinner fish. I was swimming in the ungodly waters of filth and sin. I was unrighteous with no God on my side. And Satan had his fishing rod and he was reeling me in at every hand and he was toying with me, throwing me back in and putting me on another hook, catching me and throwing me back in. But I thank God that one day a fisher of men, a lover of souls, Jesus Christ was on the hook and I surrendered myself and God caught me up in the gospel net and he saved my soul. He turned me around. He gave me new life and there are other folk waiting for you to do the same for them. My Savior one Friday died that you and I could fish. He didn't stay dead though, CJ, because if he had just stayed dead, we wouldn't have no bait. But because my Savior rose up on the third day and declared that I am King of Kings, and because I'm King of Things, all authority in heaven and earth is in my hands. He gave us the bait to go fish with. Because he rose up again, if he lives in us, we can go tell the story. This Jesus declared that we should go and make disciples of every nation. He said, not only am I king, but you should be expanding the kingdom. Follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. If you're here today and you don't know Jesus, in the full pardon of sin, what better day and what better way than to come right now and put yourself on the hook of Jesus Christ. Is there someone today 